So Andy Ross is a Grammy-winning musician and guitarist for OK Go, who has performed on the MTV Music Awards, The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, Late Show with David Letterman, and Late Night with Conan O'Brien. OK Go's Here It Goes Again video, known affectionately as the Treadmill video, won YouTube's 2006 Most Creative Award and was one of the early YouTube phenomenons with nearly 40 million plays to date. Andy is a graduate from Columbia University with a degree in computer science and is still actively programs for various political efforts like opencongress.org. Andy recently met with members of Congress to discuss the issue of internet neutrality and has actively supported the Barack Obama campaign through various Obama musical performances. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Ross and Eitan Oren. Thank you. First of all, uh, I want to thank you for coming in today. The, the record's coming out on November 11th uh, in stores, but Andy actually brought advanced copies for everybody here today, which is awesome. So you will all be the first ones to hear it. And it's a great record, and we're, we're honored to have you. Thank you. I'm uh, honored that you guys chose this over the nap room, which <laughs> I'd like to check out later. Um, so, but thanks. Cool. Um, I wanted to start out actually talking about your first record. Um, not that many people necessarily know about it. Um, it's something that you did back in 2004. Um, and that record was very much uh, an emotional breakup record. And um, at that time, you were a, a programmer in New York. Um, and that record kind of led to your moving to LA and joining OK Go. Can you tell us a little bit about that period of time? Well, how much time do you guys have? Um, uh, yes, I was a programmer in New York. I uh, went to Columbia and stayed here after college and um, working in the lovely language of Java for a startup downtown. And uh, you guys have it really good here, and we had it really good too uh, until um, reality set in. And uh, then all the Twinkies were gone from the break room and the massages left. So uh, you should take the Twinkies now. It's, it's a good time. Um, but... Uh, so yeah, I was, uh, I was in a long distance relationship and um, she was in LA, I was in New York. We decided that we were gonna try to put things together. I was gonna move to LA and um, so I quit my job, I got out of my lease and then right before I moved to LA, I decided uh, I didn't wanna move to LA and freaked out. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was living at home with no job, uh, no apartment, no girlfriend and my band also broke up in the same month. So um, it was sort of a clean slate, and I had just purchased like the personal like Pro Tools um, like home unit. Had no idea how to use it. So of course, uh, I, a friend and I, Travis, he's actually going to play with me later. Um, decided that we should try to charge people money for recording them, and we didn't know how to do it. So um, amazingly, that worked, and uh, we started on a small bathroomless shack in Long Island moved to a small bathroomless shack in Queens, moved to uh, a loft in um, Bushwick, and now uh, Serious Business Music, which is what it's called, is still running, and it's now in Soho on Spring Street um, with the increase in rent to go along with that. So, um, and Travis still runs it uh, to this day. Um, and while that was going on, I was still pretty uh, torn up about the breakup, and that's when I decided to start this solo thing and I wrote the record and it's very breakup um, heavy. So anyway, um, about a year and a half went by and we still hadn't talked. Finally, the ex-girlfriend and I did start talking again and uh, decided that this time, you know, maybe we should try it again. And uh, I did move to LA and um, within a month, joined OK Go, and went on tour for three years. So uh, um, I joined OK Go, by the way, because one of the musicians that we recorded in the studio was friends with one of the members of OK Go, and when their other guitar player quit, it sort of uh, happened that way. So um, I guess that's the long answer to the question. Uh, but yes, um, so the first record is emotional. Cool. Not, not that the second one isn't, yeah. but it's a, it's a good story. And I, I know that uh, the record actually kind of 
helped solidify winning, winning back the girl and, and moving out to LA, which also is a, a good movie ending. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, first, the first song on the record uh, is called They Got the Wrong Guy. I think a lot of OK Go fans are actually going to be surprised um, at some of the instrumentation on the record. It's, it's really ambitious. It's different than both your first record and OK Go's first record. Mm -hmm. um, that song in particular is, is uh, all strings and vocals. And um, I was curious why you chose to start with that song. Sure. Um, well, over the last year, uh, or last three years, Travis, um, the, the man in charge of serious business, has recorded a number of New York musicians and, and uh, you know, uh, he has great taste, so he always sends me the stuff that he sent that he's like recording. And uh, one of the bands he sent me was a band called Rocket Ship Park. And uh, I just totally fell in love with the record. It's like my favorite record of like the last year. And uh, the man in charge of that is Josh Kaufman. He'll be also playing with us. And um, I had a bunch of songs that sort of were sitting around as we were touring around with OK Go, just sort of like writing them on tour buses and in hotel rooms. And I had this one song that was, it was kind of good, it was kind of okay, but uh, just based on what I heard from the Rocket Ship Park stuff, I knew that Josh would do an amazing job sort of coming up with a like, very interesting string arrangement and um, just gave him the liberty to do whatever he wanted to do with it. And uh, it came out really great. Um, it's a short song, it's about uh, a minute 40 or two minutes. And uh, I just think it's an interesting way to sort of give the listener a curveball right off the bat. and. Um, it's sort of intentionally put there to sort of, um, you know, sort of maybe dismiss any expectations that someone might have because of either the last record that I did or OK Go or anything else. Just kind of wanted to be a little weird at the top. Cool. So we are actually going to show the video for the Secret Decodering first single off the record. Uh, this is also going to be a, a world premiere here since nobody's seen it yet. We're actually going to, we're, we're working right now on, on uh, figuring out a premiere online on YouTube for this. Um, this is another song that I know uh, Josh Kaufman produced. And uh, is there anything you want to tell us about the video before we roll? Um, no, why don't we just roll it and then we can talk about it. All right, this is the fade to black. All right, guys, this right here, this is gold. And this is gonna get me back together with my ex-girlfriend. Megan. Why did your girlfriend break up with you? Because she was wrong. All right, let's get to work. I couldn't do 
I knew the fake ending was going to get everyone. <clears throat> awesome. I, I really, I'm, uh, I'm really excited about the video. Thanks. Is everyone overloaded with cute right now? <laughs> we it's, cut out the part where I made like, them do push-ups or like, really like, toss the drumsticks super violently. But. It's, it's both cute and touching, so <laughs> All right. I, I, I think it rides the line perfectly. Good. Um, so tell me about the kids in the video. They're not here today performing with you, so I'm assuming you fired them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As your backing band. We're waiting for Leno to uh, put them all up there. Um, no, the kids were amazing. They were, uh, there's a Paul Green School of Rock, which I guess is a franchised um, like music academy for teaching kids how to play uh, rock music. Um, the day we went in to like, sort of check out all the kids, it was, they, it was like uh, Van Halen Day. Um, and uh, you know, like kids were like, like there's a dude playing Eruption and like Hot for Teacher, like a 12 year old girl drummer playing Hot for Teacher, which is weird. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you know, they were awesome um, and they can really play. And it's, it's sort of hard to tell in the video. I mean, there's some shots of the drummer where you can see she's actually playing the right stuff, but they can actually really play. And it's kind of scary how like confident they are. It's just kind of like leaning against the wall, like um, and they're 10 years old. Um, but uh, it was great. And, you know, with, with uh, five kids, you also get 10 stage parents. And even they weren't that uh, bad. Actually, if you're watching this, you're all great. Um, so uh, it was, it was, we're just, we're happy that we found those kids because they were all awesome. Cool. So uh, I wanted to talk about the title of the record. It's Cantorell. What's sure. the significance of that? Um, well, Cantorell is the largest oil field in Mexico. Um, I think it's the second largest in the world, uh, but that should be fact-checked. Um, and uh, just recently I've been, been sort of reading a lot about uh, oil, and you know, oil and energy policy and politics and stuff like that, and it's been on my mind. I mean, it's, it's, it's not an overtly political record. Um, it just seemed to fit. Um, what I was sort of like thinking about at the time. So uh, it's also a cool word. It is. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about the label. So you told us that Serious Business is your label that you're running with Travis Harrison. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed you had a, a, su a subtle branding uh, on, on the cassette tape in the video for that. Yeah. Uh, That's actually referring to the serious businesses of the song. But interesting. It is, it is, a, it is a subtle branding thing as well. Cool. So I, I was just curious, o OK Goes on Capital, but mm -hmm. you're putting this record out on your own. What would you say, um, how would you compare the experiences between being on a, on a huge label, big budget project versus doing something on your own? And do you have a preference or are there things that you like about one and like about the other? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you in six months uh, <laughs> once we get this one out. Um, I mean, the obvious big difference is money. And, uh, you know, for, for a major label record, they're going to be spending money. And for this, I'm going to be spending money. Um, money. Yeah, a lot of money. Um, so, uh, you know, but the, the, so yeah, I mean, a major label is going to um, pump a ton of money into it, get a lot more exposure than it probably would. And, you know, I think we have sort of realistic expectations for the sort of scale of the indie release. Um, but, you know, there are benefits. We could do whatever we wanted with the record. We could make that video any way we wanted. Um, and if something good were to happen to it, we'd stand to gain a lot more. But I think, I think what appealed to, you know, both of us the most is that we could just sort of do it on our own terms. And, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, was, that was probably the most exciting to just sort of do whatever we wanted. And I know OK Go is especially great at utilizing the internet and um, having you know, a lot of, of buzz with fans and people online. Are, are you guys going to try to do anything along those lines for the record? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the video, obviously. And uh, I wrote a sort of like viral sharing thing that um, some fans will hopefully use to win a contest to win one of the remaining signed copies of my last record. Because we, we only did an initial pressing of um, a few hundred copies, which sold out a couple years ago, and there are some fans out there that really want them. So, um, yeah, I mean, for, for us, the internet's really what it's all about. I think that 
Um, OK Go, really, in a lot of ways, is a band that, that showed everybody what could be done for bands um, on YouTube. And um, we're going to show a little video now, actually. Um, the first video that OK Go did uh, in, involving dancing was the, the backyard dancing. And there were, you guys actually had a contest? Uh, yes. Well, actually, what happened first is we, we made this video, or we made the backyard dancing video. I don't think we're showing that. But basically, it's us performing this sort of elaborate choreographed dance in one take in, in, uh, in the backyard of the singer's house. And we sort of put it up just to like show our friends. And uh, we recorded it as a, re a rehearsal tape, but we thought it was funny. So we put it up to show our friends um, this dance, and it actually sort of spread virally. Um, and the next crazy thing is that uh, videos of other people doing the dance, like at weddings and talent shows, and like <laughs> in the middle of the street started showing up on YouTube. So we were like, this is awesome. Why don't we do a contest where um, if you do a dance and we'll be the judges and we we decide that you're the winner, you'll, we'll fly you out and you can do it on stage with us at a show. So, um, but yeah, it started out as this totally um, just user generated um, thing, which wouldn't have been possible without YouTube. So we can, sh this, this is sort of like a compilation of a bunch of the different ones. So this was the, the prelude to the treadmill video, which was a huge hit first on YouTube. It has almost 40 million hits today that migrated onto VH1. And then you guys were actually asked to perform it live on the VMAs. And um, I know that the actual shooting of the treadmill video, you guys had to do about 20 takes uh, until you could get through it without hurting yourselves in any way. How did you feel when you were then asked to do it live in front of millions of people? I said, hell no. I'm not doing that. Um, uh, no, I was. I, I, I maybe was the most apprehensive, um, but uh, we actually heard, we actually got offered this when we were in Spain doing some festival, and uh, we sort of had a group meeting, and I was like, I don't know, guys, I don't know, what if we fall, you know, stuff like that. But uh, uh, I, I was convinced, and um, it turned out to be a good decision that we did it. Um, uh, and it, it, it was fun. We came back to New York um, and sort of practiced for like uh, 10 days and um, to simulate the, uh, you know, the, the celebrities that would be in the crowd, we got like 50 people magazines and plastered like pictures of celebrities on the walls in front of us. Um, there were some pretty odd ones, like I think uh, Muqtada al Sadr was in the crowd at Radio City. Uh, who knows how he got there, but... Uh, uh, yeah, and the performance is totally surreal. I don't really remember it. I definitely had a panic attack like when the show started, but it was surprisingly calm when we got up on stage. So, and I, and I remember you actually jumped for joy when you guys finished it. Yes, yes, that that was <laughs> on un, camera. That was unrestrained joy. <laughs> um, yeah. So l let's talk about the the music industry a little bit. Everybody knows record sales are down a little bit, mm -hmm. maybe a lot of bit. Um, in general, there, there's a lot of shifts. The, the entire music economy seems to really be shifting. Um, recently, you know, a real interesting phenomenon I've seen a lot of big companies like Tag Body Spray has their own record label now. Mountain Dew has a record label. MySpace is rolling out this, this big uh, music venture where they're partnering with labels and they're going to be sharing ad um, revenue with the labels. In terms of, of the online world, do artists feel that revenue generated around music content online could be a major source of revenue? Is that a hope? Yeah, I mean, sure. I think, I think, um, I think the music industry is still obviously, as you mentioned, struggling to find a way to make money on selling music. Um, and there's various different schemes that they're they've come up with, but it seems like nothing's really uh, working. Uh, licensing is a great way for musicians to uh, make money on their songs. And, um, you know, OK Go has done well in that field. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the possibilities are endless. Hopefully, um, someone here can figure out how to do it, because, uh, you know, it would be great to, you know, a, a success like the, the treadmill video or um, 
you know, some sort of viral thing online, if it could be monetized, could be really great for a band or musician or a label. Even the major labels, I'm sure, will benefit. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it's uh, something for people smarter than I to uh, to come up with, and hopefully they're sitting right here. And if you don't mind me picking your brain for a minute, in terms of YouTube specifically, do you have any suggestions maybe for how YouTube might be able to do an even better job of helping connect artists and fans? Um, well, I just recently set up the Secret Decoder Ring YouTube page, so I did get to play with a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think if the, if, I think it could be more, um, you know, more uh, artist friendly, kind of like MySpace, uh, media players because you know most bands won't have a video for all their songs but maybe you could have more songs in the page maybe tour dates and stuff and not to not to replace like something that like that's traditionally what like myspace would that's sort of like their realm but you know any outlet that a fan can find the uh you know your music at to have all that information there i think would be beneficial so um you know that would be contingent on on YouTube wanting to go into a more music uh, centric direction, but uh, yeah, that would, I think that would help. Cool. We we appreciate the feedback. So uh, I'll, Andy's I'll bill you hourly. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Andy's going to be performing uh, three songs now, and um, the uh, the Google Four Quartet is going to be joining for the last one. That's so. correct. Are we going to do this? All right. So this is off the uh, the aforementioned breakup record. Uh, it's called Twenty Three.
that is emotional. Um, this next song is off the new record, which y'all have. It's called I Blew Myself Up Over You, which is either the worst or best name ever. <laughs> called I Don't Want to Know About My City.
I just wanted to uh, compliment you guys on that because it was amazing. Really. Um, I know that uh, the, the, the string arrangement that they just did, Josh actually wrote especially for this event. And um, I think the quartet did an amazing job. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about your computer programming because you, despite being a rock star, are actually still an active computer programmer um, in your spare time. Why, why would a rock star choose to keep computer programming in his spare time? Um, are there any developers here? Yeah, all right. It's really funny that, that uh, the sales force can't be here today and it's all engineers because a- Andy kept asking me, are, are the engineers going to be there? I want there to be engineers. Oh, I actually, I'm the one that sent that email. It's a fake. It's just so the engineers would be here. Um, uh, awesome. Keep it strong, guys. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, well, when, uh, so I was a programmer. That was what I, I actually went to school for electrical engineering with a minor in CS. Um, and that's kind of what I always did and then realized that I didn't really want to have a job where I sat at a desk all day. Um, but I told that story. So um, you didn't mean that insultingly, did you? No, 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 no. <laughs> I because we, we love sitting at desks all day. I'm just, yeah. Well, you guys I'm just putting it out there. You guys can sit on these like exercise balls, so it's it's in, it's very colorful here. I would love to work here, but I don't think I could make it through the like uh, fifteen rounds of uh, brain teasers. Does that happen? Is that does that is that true? Cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I got offered a Microsoft interview when I graduated, and I heard about that, and I just, I didn't think I would be very good at that, so I didn't, I didn't go. Um, but, um, yeah, so when I, when I started touring with OK Go, um, uh, they, when I started, they were, they were, you know, paying me to tour with them, and uh, it, was, it wasn't very much. So I sort of started programming on the road, as uh, a necessity to, you know, make sure all the bills um, could get paid and everything. And um, I sort of just got used to doing it. When you're a touring musician, there's lots of downtime. Um, You'll have a sound check uh, at 5 and then a show at, you know, 11. And then you're in a city, you know, you're in, like, Omaha um, on, like, a Tuesday. And uh, not... Omaha's great if it's anyone from Omaha. But, uh, um, you know, there's, there's lots of downtime, and especially if you're not feeling particularly motivated to go see what Omaha has to offer, um, you will spend 16 hours in the dressing room of whatever club you're playing. So I just sort of, like, because I sort of needed the work, learned how to do it on the road, um, and then as OK Go became more successful, I sort of switched moving from a regular freelance thing to working on projects that I cared about. Um, and right now I focus on a, a website called open on, uh, opencongress.org. And um, it's, a, uh, it's a Ruby on Rails site. What do people think of Ruby on Rails? In one of these? One of these? Yeah. Um, I give it one of these, especially, uh, especially version one. So. Um, uh, it's a website that tracks all of the bills, senators, representatives, committees in Congress. Um, it aggregates lots of data, official government data, um, uh, aggregates news and blog content, and is also a user community site. So you can, um, you can create an account and find people uh, who care about the same bills, cares about the same issues. Um, the main problem we thought with finding information about like legislation and um, what your representatives are doing is that the government really only provides one website called Thomas, which has all the official data, but it's, um, I mean, it's not even web 1.0, it's like web negative 57. Um, It's like so unreadable, the interface is terrible. Um, So we wanted to present the data in a way where people could see the important stuff up front and interact with other users. and it actually, the, 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 one of the unemployment bills that was sort of um, going through Congress a few months ago, there was this community that's just sort of like exploded on it around um, these people not getting their unemployment extensions and just like support group just happened on it. So it was really gratifying to finally see like something like that happen um, on it. 
So that's open Congress. You, if you guys check it out, that would be great. To, uh, talk to us a little bit about internet neutrality. I know recently you uh, met with members of Congress and consulted about it. Yeah, well, uh, the singer of OK Go, Damien, and I went to um, Washington. Damien actually testified on a, uh, um, I don't remember the committee, but he testified in a committee hearing about net neutrality. Um, I know net neutrality is a huge issue for Google and YouTube um, because of the implications. Um, but uh, it, everyone knows net neutrality, what it is and everything. We're, the developers are here, so. But um, yeah, I mean, net neutrality enabled uh, OK Go's to, uh, success to some degree. Um, and uh, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing because it's, it's neutral and uh, because everyone has you know, a fair uh, uh, you know, say on the internet. And, and uh, we strongly believe that it should remain that way. You guys also, okay, go. You did a few, or, or maybe just one main uh, show to benefit the Obama campaign during the primaries. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you actually got to meet Barack Obama recently. Can you tell us what that was like, and how are you feeling about the the way the election is going and the debates yeah. coming up? I was very giddy. Uh, he's very tall. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we happened to be playing in um, Laramie, Wyoming, the same day that he was giving a speech, and. Um, we just we, we just got lucky and we were able to meet him and uh, it was very quick it was about 30 seconds and we got a picture but uh it was great um yeah i don't know i i think the election's going okay it's hard to tell right now uh hopefully he'll win cool so we're going to do some q and a if you guys have any questions no brain teasers hi hello uh, my What's name is name? Jake. Jake? And yeah. Nice to meet you, Jake. Sure for Jesus, but that's a big story. Uh, I can see that you're very knowledgeable in, like, internet, new technologies, and, and you're a programmer. And uh, I don't know if you know that, for example, when, like, radio was, like, 30 years ago, like, songs were, like, two minutes, three minutes, and there was a huge breakthrough when, like, five-minute songs started going out, and... And uh, during the 80s, for example, Mike Caulfield released a few albums, and they were like, one of them, Amarok, was like 47 minutes long, and still had a little pause in the middle so that it could fit in, a, in an LP. Because back then, like, CDs were not like, out there. Mm -hmm. And I see that like, we're now in 2008, and you still are releasing a CD with uh, nine, uh, nine, yeah. nine songs. And have you thought about like using like all the medias or the ways to to like put music out there like fifteen little songs for kids uh, sure. that don't fit in a CD at all and or like something that is short something that is too long something that is like totally different and, and not restrict yourself to a CD. Sure, that's a great question. Um, I think because um, OK Go is very well known, whereas my solo project is not very well known sort of the um, classic models of promotion are album-based. Um, I sort of made the decision to start with that sort of form of release to put out there. Um, I think you're right, though. I think that that's actually... The, the future is, is going to be, um, you know, bands putting out singles every month or putting out an EP every couple of months and just sort of keeping the, um, the, the content coming. I think, I think the album is, you know, album is, albums are still great and when someone makes a great album, um, you know, it's hard to imagine like, okay, computer, any way else. So um, I, I, I think you're right, I think that... Um, but it's really easy to imagine a Britney Spears album with one song and that's it. It, it is it is easy to uh, to to see that and and you know major labels have started signing artists to single deals where they'll you know you, you're signed to like a three song deal and basically they see how that how that happens it's it's starting to happen but I think the album model is so entrenched that it's going to be this way for a while and and uh, you know until the until the industry sort of figures out how they're going to deal with this new technology that's probably, it'll probably be that way for a little bit. 
Hello. Uh, hello. My name is Don Tom. Um, I was wondering if you could talk uh, just a little bit about your songwriting process, like how you record sketches or uh, lyric ideas, sort of what, what kind of technology or lack of technology you might <laughs> use. Yeah. Um, sure. Usually I will uh, write music first. So I will 90% of the time sit with an acoustic guitar and come up with music that I like. Uh, in terms of like sketching that, uh, I'll either use a computer. Uh, GarageBand is is really convenient for that. Um, since the iPhone just came out with apps, that's been the best thing for sort of getting an idea down onto into a recording. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, in in terms of lyrics, lyrics are a pretty time-consuming process for me. On this record, actually, I worked with um, a fantastic lyricist. Uh, Joe Weissman, and um, uh, sometimes I'll be so stumped by a song, like how do I get words to fit with this, that uh, I've collaborated with him a lot, and, and um, he usually comes through with flying colors. But, uh, you know, usually usually words will start with like something I'm singing just to like put down, maybe they'll come up with ideas. Uh, sometimes I'll just like read uh, words on like a newspaper or like a poetry book and maybe there's like one word in there that sort of like fits. Um, but it's usually always kind of different. Um, but. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Hunter. Uh, my question is, uh, what value do you see in printing CDs anymore, in physical CDs? Uh, again, it was sort of a decision to because um, because the people that were going to sort of work with the record were doing it in this way, that's why I printed CDs. Um, I don't know. A lot of people still buy CDs, um, and uh, you know, I think I think even Radiohead, who had such a successful online release, still, you know, a few months later, decided to put out CDs and. You know, the reason is some people still buy them. Um, again, I think this is something that's going to, you know, sort of fall off the curve. Um, I think we're seeing vinyl making a comeback. Um, and, you know, I, could, I can see as bandwidth increases and um, CD quality becomes something that anyone can get immediately, CDs will probably um, go the route of the album. Maybe. Great. So um, I guess that about wraps it up. I want to thank all you guys for coming. If any of you want to see Andy uh, and Secret Decoder Ring playing with the, the full band plugged in, they're going to be doing a show tonight down on the Lower East Side at a club called Rehab. It's um, Avenue B and Second Street. Is that right? Somewhere around there. <laughs> um, you, you can go to myspace.com slash secret decoder ring. You guys and can just info. Google it. Um, and then they'll be on at around 11. Uh, also, I guess we're going to set Andy up at the table over here if anybody wants to get their CD signed. And Andy, thank you so much for coming in. It was really great. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>